lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Um, I've known about James White for some time. In fairness, he actually did write a decent book refuting Ruckmanism, King James Onlyism. It is a decent book. The man is not a complete charlatan or a complete clown. He's not that. He has done some very good things. We have common ground. He shares my opposition to the ecumenical movement. He understands what is fundamentally wrong doctrinally and theologically with Roman Catholicism. Those things are to his credit. He's also somebody who's active in uh, apologetics against cults. I have no problem with all of these things and other things he does. It's not like he's a complete charlatan, and it's not like we do not have common ground. Like myself, he also opposes open theism. Well, he didn't mention the figure. Of course, Clark Pinnock, we've been warning about him for many years. Um, on the other hand, while I can say he's not a complete charlatan, there is a charlatan element. There's something fundamentally wrong with somebody who pretends to have valid doctorates. Um, Dr. Benny Hinn, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, these things are nonsense. They're degrees that are either honorary or they're awarded by a non-accredited institution. This pseudo-academic fraud, it's, these people are not genuinely scholars. If they don't have a doctorate, why would they say they do? Now, from my own background, and I'm very straight about it, my background was in science, not theology. I didn't go to Bible college and seminary until I was older, which was in England and at Cambridge University in, in Great Britain, and at London Bible College, London School of Theology. Afterwards, I did my postgraduate research at Cambridge at Tyndale House and at London School of Theology uh, for an MPhil, which I decided to convert instead of taking the MPhil into a doctorate. I did the academic research in Britain and at Cambridge and at uh, London School of Theology of Dr. Conrad Gemp at that time. Then I was going to complete the missiological portion at Fuller Seminary under Dr. Arthur Glasser when I had a very serious accident that's left me somewhat disabled in 1996 when my daughter and myself were seriously injured. I had to withdraw from the doctorate program at Fuller at that particular time. But I believe it was God's providence. Fuller has gone so far off since the days of Dr. McGavern, Donald McGavern, under people like Peter Wagner and the unfortunate influences of the Vineyard Movement and other things, that I wouldn't want a doctorate or anything else from, from Fuller, of which uh, Mr. White is a graduate. Uh, but, but it's not what he got his PhD or his THD either. He has two false doctorates. Now, this makes him a phony. It makes him look like a charlatan. It makes him look like a pseudo-academic fraud, a make-believe scholar. You either have the doctorate or you don't. My background was in science. I switched to theology after becoming a Christian. But I never finished my doctorate due to an accident and due to divine providence. I don't believe God wanted me to be in fuller. Our ministry grew and I didn't have time to finish it. And hence, I do not have a doctorate. But I've had many people, institutions, offering me one based on my postgraduate education and research. I could easily get a phony doctorate and put it on the wall and call myself doctor. But it's dishonest. Christians should not behave that way. When I see somebody doing what he did, and there's others like it, Rodney Brown does it, Kenneth Copeland does it, Thomas Ice does it, it is dishonest. It's charlatanism. It reveals an insecurity. It reveals some kind of an intellectual pride and a sense of inferiority that they have to get a phony degree from a non-accredited institution. If a doctorate is not awarded by an accredited institution, it is essentially useless. It's make-believe. They're buying titles. It's crazy. Yet he poses himself as this great learned scholar when he has two false doctorates. Something is wrong with this guy, not just as an academic or as an apologist, 
but he's got some kind of a problem in his own life, his own walk with the Lord, when he has to resort to this kind of dishonesty and deception, misrepresenting himself as having a scholarly credential that he does not have. Now, I regret in some ways not having finished my own doctorate, but it was for medical reasons and it was for providential reasons. It never happened. If God wanted it to, it would have. I'm good with that. No, I'm not an academic, but I am academically trained. I'm not a scholar, but I am scholarly. I will put my academic education up against anyone's, including James White's any day. He belittles certain things, beginning with my name. Now notice before dealing with the issue, he takes the ad hominem approach. James, Jacob, they mean the same thing. Well, due to the Jacobites in the King James Bible, yes, Jacobus from Latin was mistranslated as James. Why is that? I was named after my father's grandfather, who was Jacob. They came to the United States. They anglicized it to James. I immigrated to Israel. It goes back to Jacob or Yaakov. My family is bilingual, live in Israel, live in England, live in America. Hence, I have legal documents saying my name is Jacob, and I have legal ID saying my name is James. To apply for an American passport as an expatriate and to have obtained British residency and right of abode in Great Britain, I have to show all names that I use legally, James Jacob. That is my legal name for legal reasons because of my situation of having legal identification from two countries that I had to present both to the American State Department and to the British Home Office. That's my name. I don't know why he makes a joke of it. However, he's wrong. It's not like Johann and Johannes and John mean the same. James is simply the way that the Jacobites mistranslated Jacob. So he's wrong. He also made fun of my Arabic. Well, my Arabic is not fluent. It's pretty good. If you go on our website, Questions for Our Arab Friends, you'll hear the Arabic version of, of me presenting the gospel, asking questions to Muslims in Arabic. Now, my Arabic is not absolutely fluent, but it's not bad for a non-Arab. I'd like to hear his Arabic. It's not insha'Allah, that's pronunciation. Two separate words in Arabic, inja, Allah, inja, Allah. They are two separate words, Mr. White. Don't misrepresent yourself as having an expertise in Arabic when you don't. I'm informed by a number of people who would know in academic circles and Greek believers, that my Greek is pretty good. I speak at a Greek church. I'm allowed to speak in English, but I have to expound from the Greek scriptures. I'm one of the only non-Greeks they allow in because I'm one of the only people who can expound the Greek. I'm translated from English into Greek, but I have to read the Greek. And believe me, that church, if I made any mistakes, they would call me on it. No, my Greek is pretty good. I don't think yours is all quite that good. My Hebrew is also fluent. I can speak Hebrew as you can English. I also read Latin, not as well as I did in my youth, but I certainly can read things like the Vulgate. And I get this attack, some kind of demeaning. He's ignorant, he's unlearned. I don't think he's read. Reformed theology. You don't get a degree from London School of Theology unless you've read Calvin's Institutes and passed an exam on it. In the British grading system, I have the equivalent of a, I believe, a B plus. I'm well familiar with a number of Reformed writers, particularly the Puritans. Some of them were less Calvinistic than others, such as Richard Baxter and Joseph Ailey. Others like John Owen were more Calvinistic. But don't tell me I'm not familiar with Reformed theology. I exactly am. And don't misrepresent what I said out of context. I never said that Calvin never spoke of the New Testament. I said the basis of Calvinism as Calvin taught it was not Tulip. That came from Beza and the Remonstrance of Dort. It did. I said he believed there were two covenants, one Adamic and one Abrahamic. You know very well that he sees the covenant, that Calvin saw the covenant of grace as somehow subordinate to the Abrahamic covenant. The emphasis in Calvin's theology, which was covenant theology, was on the covenant with Adam 
and the covenant with Abraham, something never found in Scripture. What I said was valid and true. I never said he didn't believe in the New Testament. I simply said it was not the basis of his theological paradigm, which it was not. Yet you just have to be mean. You, you do the same thing with Dave Hunt or with anyone else who agrees with you, setting yourself up and accusing others of creating straw men or red herrings when you cannot refute the issues they pointed out. I've said a number of times, Calvinism is essentially humanist philosophy pretending to be doctrinal theology. Someone must simply read Calvin's secular commentary on Seneca's De Clementia to see that he handled scripture the same way as he handled the Latin classics. He repeatedly appealed to patristic authority by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine. While New Testament Christianity is apostolic, not patristic, our faith comes directly from what the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write. There is no doctrinal authority from Augustine. The only good thing Augustine probably did was refute Pelagianism. Yet Calvin ascribed authority to him doctrinally. You also are a Reformed Baptist. You have a big problem. Calvin would have called you an Anabaptist and you would have been arrested in Geneva. Yet you foolishly, absurdly, call your ministry Radio Free Geneva. In the 16th century, you would have been arrested as a Baptist in your free Geneva by Calvin's police, by Pharrell and the thugs and religious hooligans. The Christian Mutawa who ran it as a theocratic police state. They would have arrested you, Mr. White. Why don't you be honest? If you're a Baptist, Calvin wouldn't have liked you. Either would Zwingli, he might have drowned you. Either would Luther. Why don't you stop the nonsense? You set yourself up as having some kind of an intellectual superiority where you just demean others instead of dealing with the issues because you can't. You're unable to deny what I said about apartheid and the relationship with the Dutch Reformed Church. Your defense of Calvin's actions or the witch burnings by the Calvinists in England and in Massachusetts and Salem was absurd. Simply stated, you were saying, well, the Roman Catholic Church did the same thing. That's a defense. That is a defense. The Mali, uh, Maleficatum, this is absurd. That's not a defense. I thought the Reformation was to reform what was wrong with the church. I thought Protestantism was to put things right, not to continue the errors of Rome. Just because Rome did it, does that justify Calvin doing it? You have a warped way of thinking. The Reformation was, in theory, to put things right, not to perpetuate what was wrong including the legacy of Augustine and patristic authority. Calvin repeatedly appealed not to the Texas Receptus of Erasmus, as Luther did, or as Tyndale did. He did not go back to the original scriptures. He went to the Vulgate of Jerome, the Roman Catholic Bible. That's what Calvin did. Then I point out the philosophical kindred or cognate parallelism between the fatalism of Islam, Inja Allah, and Calvin's predestination. And you say, well, look, was Roman Catholicism influenced by Islam? Of course it was. Of course it was. I never said it wasn't. You had the Summa Theologia of Thomas Aquinas, a Thomas, and yes, Norman Geisler is a Thomas. That's my problem with it. Aquinas wrote the Summa Theologia much the same as Rambam. Maimonides wrote Guide for the Perplexed under the influences of the Aristotelian philosophy that combined with Islam in North Africa, particularly Egypt. Yes, Roman Catholicism was very much influenced by Islam. 
so too, everything from the flagellation rituals that you see taking place or saw taking place in medieval convents and monasteries were copied from the Shia Muslims commemorating the Battle of Kabbalah when Ali, Muhammad's grandnephew, was killed. This was brought back to Europe by the Crusades. Many influences of Islam were brought back to Europe by the Crusades. The buttresses and the Moorish arches used in much of the Renaissance construction were copied from Islam for Roman Catholic edifices and cathedrals. I never denied this. It's true in philosophy, it's true in the theology, it's even true in their architecture. But it's also true of Calvinism. Calvin parallels into Allah. This fatalism, it is the same spirit. That's why they did the same things as you see in Saudi Arabia and with the Taliban. That was the police state. Let's understand this even further. You've not responded to the issues. You're unfortunate, your unfortunate mishandling of scripture was rather hideous. You point to the big three. I made citation of First Timothy chapter two, verse four. God who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Somehow you asegetically, not exegetically, but asegetically determine this to me. All kinds of people, as in different tribes and nations. This is ridiculous. Let's look at the text in context. The term genus, kinds, or no case ending variation of it, appears anywhere in the Greek text. Neither does the word ethnon for ethnic nations, neither does the term phule for tribes. These terms don't even appear there. Given that there's no chapter divisions in the original Greek canon, we look and see, I want prayers to be delivered in the treaties and tuxes in Greek, intercessions on behalf of all men. Not only is there an absence of any inference of what you say that it means all kinds of men, but reading in the context of the epistle fundamentally disproves your contention. Let's read further in the same epistle. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, the same epistle. For it is for this we labor and strive, because we fix our hope on the living God, God who is the savior of all men, especially of believers. Soter panton anthropon, melistas piston, malistas piston, those of the faith, especially those of the faith, melistas, superlative adverb. All men, text, context, co-text within the epistle itself. Your exegesis is not exegesis, it's asegesis. It's ludicrous. Therefore, you have to resort to what amounts to philosophical instead of exegetical arguments, extrapolating all kinds of things, diverting into differences between the Islamic view of God and the Calvinistic view of God. That was not the issue. The issue is the parallelism between different views of determinism. Kappa essentially and functionally becomes or equals inja Allah. I'd like to hear your Arabic. Go on our website for the evangelistic clip and you can hear mine. I'd like to hear your Greek. You didn't look at the original meaning of the original languages in your refutation. Dr. White, you're not a stupid man. Your book on King James was a good book. In this age of ecumenical deception, I generally welcome fellowship with other believers who understand the seductions of Roman Catholicism and ecumenical union 
with churches that are not scripturally Christian. I have no argument with your apologetic material contra the cults. None. Nonetheless, at the end of the day, you are a fraud. And needlessly, you're not a stupid man, you're just an insecure one. Dr. James White? If you want a doctorate, go earn one. My name is Jacob Pash. God bless and thank you.